There was a sense that this is a profound opportunity to focus on something other than what we tend to focus on in our daily labors. Coming to understand the landscape, the people from 175 different countries, and I learned that inside of my head is an interesting place. <laughs> <laughs> this is In Good Faith, listening to first-person experiences of faith and belief. On In Good Faith, it's our privilege to hear stories and accounts from believers told in their own words. Our hope is to listen with an open heart, celebrating the power of faith and belief and what those stories mean to the ones who tell them. I'm speaking in good faith today with John Rosenberg, Associate Academic Vice President for Undergraduate Studies here at Brigham Young University, also currently the Washington Irving Professor of Spanish and American Relations at Brigham Young University. He has bachelor's and master's from BYU and a master's and PhD from Cornell University. John Rosenberg, thank you for coming in today. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Well, I think we're going to take our listeners on a journey. That's the subject of the Camino de Santiago. And I wonder if, in a nutshell, you could tell someone who's never heard of this what this pilgrimage journey is. Christian tradition tells us that the Apostle James, the brother of John, evangelized Spain, and after his martyrdom under the sword of Herod, as described in the book of Acts, was taken by his disciples back to Spain and buried in an old Roman cemetery in northwestern Spain, in a place that is now called Santiago de Compostela. Hundreds of years after he was buried, again, according to tradition, his body was rediscovered. Uh, this was in the uh, ninth century. And this was a very important moment for the Christian world to have found the relics of one of Jesus Christ's closest associates. And not long after that, the pilgrimage began and eventually became what in the mindset of the medieval person was a worldwide phenomenon with people coming from all over Europe, meeting on the Camino, walking over the course of about a year to pay their respects at the tomb of the Apostle James. And in the process, as people of different languages and traditions and folk stories and architectural styles began to mix on the Camino, there began to develop a sense of what Europe itself is. And those styles and stories and musical traditions began to find manifestations across all of Europe that were common in many ways while retaining their local flavor. So in many ways, the Camino de Santiago was not just a landmark a moment in Western religious history, but it was fundamental in creating the very idea of Europe. Mm. Two questions leap to mind. Some folks would make a pilgrimage for the purpose of seeking a healing for themselves or someone else to Lourdes in France, for instance. Was there a particular goal for the folks who would take this particular pilgrimage? They're going to the church built on the site. What was their purpose? Many different purposes. Healing was one of them. Mm -hmm. And one of the most important manuscripts that we have from the Middle Ages about uh, the Camino is called the, the Codex Calixtinus. And in its pages, we actually find a catalog of all of the diseases uh, oh that pilgrims uh, went in search of a cure of and then reported that indeed the miracle had been performed. Certainly, many pilgrims went as a spiritual journey in the sense that all pilgrimages are. Some went as part of the canonical law system that uh, you committed a sin or a crime against the church and your punishment, your act of restitution was to do the Camino de Santiago. There were even in kind of the odd spiritual economics of the Middle Ages, those who paid others to do the Camino <laughs> for them. And because they had made the financial offering, they were the ones that then would, would, re would receive the blessings of having done uh, the pilgrimage on uh, holy years when the saint day of, of James, which falls on the 25th of July, when one completes the, the pilgrimage, one receives forgiveness of all sins, 
plenary indulgence. And so you can imagine uh, the wealthy in Europe seeing that as a prime opportunity to hire one of their servants to do the pilgrimage for them. But it would be it would be unduly cynical to suggest that those economic elements were the primary drivers. Most of it, most of it was deep religious uh, devotion, an attempt to connect through Jesus Christ by worshiping at the tangible relics of one of his closest associates. One of the things that makes me happiest to speak to you about this is this was a Catholic tradition. You are not Catholic, but you decided to do this. Tell me about that. There's both historical, aesthetic, and then a personal spiritual dimension to that. As a professor of Spanish literature and art, I, of course, learned about the Camino de Santiago from my earliest years of of academic study. And always had a far-off dream that that might be something that I would uh, be able to do. And so there was there was very much this sense of being able to see the places, meet the people. And over 40 years of, of working in Spain, as it turns out, I had, I had actually seen all of those places multiple times in, in, in different guises. But this was going to be the first time that they were all connected together mm. in a narrative, as it were, so that one day would build on the other one and bring us to a different kind of destination. But there was absolutely, for me and for the students I take on this program, a sense that this is a profound opportunity to focus day after day, mile after mile, hour after hour, on something other than what we tend to focus on in our daily labors in the world of contingencies. We didn't need to worry about making a living. We didn't need uh, to worry about the next homework assignment, although the students had some of that uh, they had to do. (laughs) But it was mostly a sense of coming to understand the landscape, the people from 175 different countries that one meets up with on the road, and eventually in what for me were very profound ways myself. I learned, and it was quite a surprise to me, that inside of my head is an interesting place. <laughs> uh, and when Because you weren't distracted from or taken anywhere else. Precisely. And that when one has the opportunity to become more self-aware, one then becomes more aware, ironically, with those things that are around us. And then eventually, through the the reverence that envelops you when you do the Camino pilgrimly, is it is enveloped in the sense of God's plan. There was a early modern philosopher, an alchemist, as it turns out, named Paracelsus, who once wrote, the world is a book and we turn its pages with our feet as we walk pilgrimly. I think the Camino de Santiago, because of its length, nearly 500 miles if one goes from the Pyrenees to Santiago, because of the accumulation of hours, because of the opportunity to put away for a moment the contingencies of history, the demands of daily life, one begins to pay attention in ways that, at least for me, are difficult in the rush of what I do every day. And that paying attention that I think is right at the heart of walking pilgrimly reflects something sacramental. You're probably aware of Simone Weil's work, early 20th century philosopher coming out of. Interesting, comes from a secular Jewish family and while never becoming a baptized Christian, becomes a bit of a Christian mystic as part of uh, her philosophical searches. She wrote a remarkable essay called Reflections on the Right Use of School Studies with a View to the Love of God. She makes the remarkable statement in that essay that every school exercise is like a sacrament. And what she means by that is that whether you're studying geometry or Latin or physics or whatever it might be, the harder it is, the better. In fact, you don't even really have to master the subject. But because it's the reaching? It is the reaching. It is the focus. It is the mental exertion 
that eventually allows one to develop the faculty of attention that she says is what is required in prayer. And so I found that that is exactly what happens to a spiritual being when one is having an experience like the Camino de Santiago, is that it is an experience that focuses the faculty of attention, helps you to see things that you normally wouldn't see, and that that faculty of attention then allows you to experience God in a way that you may not have before. Now, the, the second part of Vey's essay, she pivots to the second blessing of attentiveness. And she tells the story from the Grail Legends, which is mm -hmm. rich on the Camino de Santiago. There are at least two different places on the Camino de Santiago that claim to have uh, the Grail. But she uh, d describes that the seeker of the Grail who will eventually be able to obtain it is the one who approaches the keeper of the Grail, a king or a knight, she says, three-quarter paralyzed with the most grievous wound, and asks him, what are you going through? That question, what are you going through, is a question that is possible only by being attentive to the wounds, to the life experiences, to the joys of the other. And so for that reason, yes, this pilgrimage tradition is comes out of the Catholic tradition, but I find that for me, as a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. It is sacramental in all of the ways that we might understand that word, but especially in the sense of developing the faculty of attention that helps me develop the discipline to communicate with God and thereby to be able to see my fellow being in ways that a less disciplined soul might miss. So I read about people deciding to hike the Appalachian Trail, for instance, in the U.S., and a beautiful experience, I'm sure, beautiful landscape, all of that, perhaps a kind of nature pilgrimage, but not the same as this. So starting the Pyrenees, you say, in France, and then heading west across the entire north of Spain, coming almost to the coast. So I'm picturing that everyone who you might meet on this experience is being thoughtful, but also having a lot of fun and stopping to eat and to meet people and sort of a delightful experience, as well as the meditation of walking the trail. What can you tell me about what you saw from the travelers you met that would be different than hiking in Yellowstone or the Appalachian Trail or something like that? Yeah, again, part of it is just the extent of the road. It's, it's <laughs> the five weeks and thereby the accumulation. Uh, there are a lot of people who do just the last week of the Camino de Santiago, and that is perfectly legitimate. I don't judge that at all as being an inferior experience. But there is something that happens with the accumulation of time that makes a difference. It sounded like you were on the journey together with these people. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. The, the Camino presents opportunities for solitude, but solitude very easily can turn into loneliness, which then can become alienation. And so the solitude is regularly and communally interrupted by conversations that are unanticipated and full of grace. As you walk up behind somebody, or in my case, because I was a slow walker, people would walk up behind <laughs> me and a conversation would start. Mm. You would learn about another life and you would learn about why they are on the Camino. So when you said you would learn to see things you wouldn't normally see, is that part of what you're talking about? Absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, that's the most important thing for me. Seeing the nature, seeing the architecture, seeing the sculpture for me is... As a humanities guy, all of that is powerful and moving, but it absolutely is the connection that you make with other human beings. And it's interesting that the word pilgrim itself, in its Latin words, you, roots, you have per, which is perimeter. It's walking around on the outside. Hmm. And then A-G-E-R, where we get our word acre or agriculture. And so the idea is that hmm. this is not the person in the field. This is the person who is walking around the field. In other words, the person who doesn't belong in the field. In other words, the person who's the stranger. 
And the process of the pilgrimage is the process of becoming a stranger no more. A stranger no more to yourself, a stranger no more to God, and a stranger no more to your fellow beings with whom you are communing and sharing stories and ministering to and being ministered by as you share this remarkably strenuous but powerful, powerful human experience. So there is this wonderful moment at the end of the Camino de Santiago as you come into the cathedral. There is a magnificent sculptural grouping that we call El Portico de la Gloria, the, the doorway to heaven. And the trumeau of that doorway, the trumeau is the, is the column that supports the double arches of, of the door, mm. so it's the central column, is a carving of the Tree of Jesse. The Tree of Jesse in the artistic tradition is the genealogy of Christ, as we have in the scriptures. And it is always represented by Jesse sleeping and the vine growing out of him. And then on the branches of the vine, you have the ancestors of Christ. And it finally finishes at the top with Mary and eventually the triumphant Savior. This particular tree of Jesse at about the height of your chest has indentations in it that fit perfectly an average-sized human hand. You can't do this now, but you used to be able to walk up to that tree of Jesse and place your hand in those marks. Now, tradition says, oh, isn't this awesome? Millions of pilgrims over 800 years put their hand there and have have worn the stone down. So it turns out that's not right. The original artist appears to have carved those there. And what he seems to be saying is, you are no more strangers. You are coming from all parts of the world, and you are all putting your hands here and being adopted into the genealogy mm. of Christ. Wow. Now, not everybody has that experience. Were you worried? This is a strange question, but sometimes when you get what you think you wanted, it may not turn out to be that. And sometimes people will make a pilgrimage to a meaningful place hoping for a very stirring experience, and it may or may not happen. So I, I, I'm so interested to hear about your expectations and then the experience. Everybody brings their personal expectations. And when I take students, I tell them, what is your Camino going to be? What is it going to mean for you? What do you want to get out of it? What is your search? And of course, you start that way and may end up discovering that it means something entirely, entirely different. Some pilgrims have absolute epiphanies. They experience the presence of God on the Camino. Others may hope for that, and they end up having a different kind mm. of experience. But if you're attentive in the way that Simone Weil suggests, or to put it another way, there's a Jesuit tradition called Lectio Divina that is all about how to read. And part of that tradition is to experience the scriptures in all five of your senses. So, for example, James Martin in his book, The Jesuit Guide to Almost Everything, <laughs> takes us through this experience where he talks about the draught of fishes and says, okay, when you read this, imagine what it looked like, right down to the details of the grain in the wood. Imagine what that wood felt like to the touch or what the coarse fabric felt like to the bodies. Imagine the sounds, the whipping of the sails, the groans of the fishermen. Imagine the smells, fishy. Uh, imagine the tastes. And what he's saying is that attentiveness is manifested in a fully embodied experience. We experience not just cognitively, but through all of our senses, what was going on. Now, so one can do the Camino de Santiago and think that it is entirely a spiritual experience without recognizing that there is no Camino without the body and that the body and the spirit are not two different entities, that they are bound together in a single entity. And the spirit of the Camino is experienced through the senses through the sights, sounds, touches, smells, tastes, 
that accumulate and then become a part of that of that conversation. So f- for me, getting back to your original question, the Camino began, I think, as an experience in the humanities, because that's how I'm formed, and became sacramental in the ways that Simone Weil suggests. It became a way for me to learn how to pay attention to those things that matter most in my prayers, in my attempt to experience God, in my attempt to understand my fellow beings on their terms, see the world for a moment through their eyes, develop something more than empathy, develop compassion, Hmm. which suggests feeling You have literally walked the road with your fellow beings, which we're all doing every day, if we might notice it. That is right. And there's one moment that I write about in my journal on the Camino of crossing a crucial bridge in Puente la Reina. It's a beautiful bridge. And much of Camino tradition suggests that this is the threshold for the Camino. You ascend to the apex of the bridge, and then you descend into the new life of the pilgrimage. And on the near side of that bridge, there was a beggar. And I gave him some money and went on my way. And about an hour later, I realized I completely missed it. There was a life there. I acknowledged him in the minimal way that any decent human being would acknowledge him. But I didn't really see him. I didn't really pay attention to him. He had a story that would have enriched my life. And being seen by me would have affected him. Which is the story of the Keeper of the Grail you talked about. Which is about. the story of the Keeper of the Grail. And so, you know, I tried to repent of, <laughs> of that and determined that I, that I was going to be seen and to see others yeah. in, um, with as much clarity as my physical strength would allow. Since you finished this pilgrimage, are there pilgrimages that you recognize from your own spiritual tradition in different ways? As you look back, you see them, or as you've moved forward, that you appreciate things in different ways? Certainly, I've become more attuned to the historical reality of pilgrimages in my in my own tradition. Uh, mm. The Exodus, which is a mega 40-year-long pilgrimage, the Exodus of my own ancestors from Europe, and then to the Midwest, and then pulling handcarts across the plains uh, to come into the valleys of Utah, a sense of life itself as a pilgrimage, which I think is very intentional in the pilgrimage tradition. There's three parts. There is a beginning, there's a middle, uh, there's an end. Hmm. I like to tell my faculty colleagues and BYU students, for example, that the young people that we get to work with at this university are in the mortality of their mortality. What I mean by that is that in our theology, we had a very robust and vital and individualized experience before we came to this world where we were nurtured by heavenly parents and then sent to earth to learn lessons that could only be learned as we were on our own. And here are our students who leave their homes where they've been nurtured, hopefully, uh, by loving parents, come to a strange place, are tested and tried in literal ways. They're asked to make (laughs) critical decisions that will be pivotal for what the other following acts of their journey. So everywhere I look, I see pilgrimage. In our own tradition in the Book of Mormon, we have a very condensed version of pilgrimage, which is the vision of the prophet Lehi, Hmm. where he sees this destination where one will be enveloped in the love of God and travelers making their way to that destination. Now, the way for rhetorical and poetic reasons, it's a very condensed version of the pilgrimage. And we tend to imagine it when it's illustrated as fitting neatly on an 8 by 11 <laughs> uh, piece of paper. But as this, the story says, the pilgrims are walking without great clarity of uh, direction. It doesn't even say they were laboring. They were laboring, yeah. uh, holding on to an iron rod mm-hmm. to not 
uh, lose their way. They they did have they did have a guide, but the way we tend to represent this is this is one chapter long. Mm. This can be grasped visually in one illustration. What I think the reality is that's a very collapsed version of the experience that the prophet Lehi is imagining. The pilgrimage goes on and on and on. And sometimes I think, although again, this isn't contained in our illustrations, sometimes we can't see anymore the tree of life. It's enveloped in the mist of darkness that defines our mortal experience. And then there are moments when we ascend a hill and the mist of darkness clears. Oh, there it is. I'm reminded by it. And then it disappears again, and we hold on to the rod. And then if you're like me with an arthritic shoulder and arthritic hands, I find that holding on to that iron rod, it's hard. My hands start to hurt. My shoulder starts to ache. And so I try to shift and hold on with the other hand, but that doesn't work very well. And then I let go, and then, oh, wait a minute, where did it go? And I have to find it again, and, okay, I'm back on it. And then it's not just the end goal. That keeps us going. It's all of the inter, and this again isn't represented in the vision, all of these intermittent graces that keep us on on the path. On the Camino de Santiago, those intermittent graces are oases. In some of the longer segments of the Camino, your distance between towns, and uh, you find that you're going a long way without a source of water, without snacks, without fruit, things that you need. Mm -hmm. And one of the Camino traditions is that the locals simply put there what is called an oasis with beverages and fruit and snacks, and they expect no payment. It's uh, their gift. That. It's their gift. Now, wow. they will say, if you'd like to help us provide for the people coming behind you, feel free to give a donation. But it's not a transaction. Mm -hmm. It's a contribution to this. To this moment, and so there, there, there are these oases, these midway stops, that keep us moving toward the tree of life in Lehi's vision. And for me personally, one of those oases in my own spiritual life is the opportunity to partake of what we call the sacrament, but what other traditions uh, call communion uh, or the Eucharist, to do that each week. And that is a moment of pause and refreshing and reassurance. As we move forward, sometimes it comes in a very simple gesture from another human being who says something kind and unexpected, who sends some kind of a note, and you say, okay, I feel a little bit stronger now. Hmm. I, can, I can take a few more steps. So for me, what the Camino de Santiago has done has helped me see ways in which the Camino is analogous to the journey of life itself. Did this confirm or change the faith that you had had throughout your life? Both of those things, mm -hmm. sure. If faith doesn't change, one begins to worry. The faith that I had as a child cannot possibly be the faith that I have in my mid-60s. One would hope. One would hope. Paul says, you know, you put away childish things. You start to see differently as you sojourn on this pilgrimage. So, yes, absolutely, I would say the, the Camino and the relationships on the Camino have changed that. And I had an experience this summer, Camino experience this summer, that I think I'm ready to talk about in more public ways. There is a monastery, a, a thousand-year-old monastery, just off the Camino, but very much a part of the Camino tradition, designed when it was originally built mm. as being a part of the flow of humanity from east to west. And because it is one of the most spectacular artistic monuments uh, in Europe. It has one of the most amazing sculptural groupings of Romanesque art uh, anywhere in Europe. I knew that I wanted to take students there. And so I started, started hanging out at the monastery and eventually became friends with two of the monks. One of them is 90 years old. The other one is much younger than I am. Hmm. And they have become dear friends and mentors and provided remarkable experiences for our students. When I took students on the Camino two years ago, 
we had them go to the monastery and they were taught by these monks the Gregorian chant and the meaning of the chant and how uh, it works as a form of meditation and a form of prayer. And then the students were invited to sing the Gregorian chants that they had learned at the at the Vespers service that night with the chapel clear full of pilgrims. It was remarkable. And then they said, we'd like you to sing some of your own music from your own tradition. And and it was it was this incredibly incredibly beautiful uh, moment. Anyway, I've become very close friends with these monks. One of them, the ninety year old, is a magnificent poet. He's the uh, organist for the monastery. Was the choir director in his younger years. A magnificent pastoral figure. And I went to have my regular visit with him to talk about having students come again and using some of his verses in my Christmas cards. And then I said, Padre Bernardo, can we kind of turn to a more serious conversation? And I made a confession that it is very easy for me to see the profound beauty of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is very easy for me to see the rational coherence of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Everything fits together for me and makes sense. But I struggle sometimes to experience in a personal way the love of God. How do you do that, Father Bernardo? And we talked about it for maybe 45 minutes. I don't remember a thing of what we said because of what happened next. Got up out of his chair, put his cane aside, still recovering from COVID, took two steps toward me, placed both of his hands on my head, and gave me a blessing. First part in Latin second part in Spanish. It's difficult for me to describe what that experience meant, except perhaps through Scripture. In our Book of Mormon, we have some verses in the first and fourth chapter of 2 Nephi where we learn about being encircled in the robes of his righteousness, being encircled in the arms of his love. And then in the 34th chapter of the Book of Alma, my favorite, being encircled in the arms of safety. In ways that I can't quite describe, all of those encirclings happened at the hands of a Benedictine monk in a remote place in Spain. Why did it happen? Because the Lord knew where to find my heart. And my obtuseness might have made it more difficult for him to minister to me in the common places of my daily life. But he knew where to he knew where to reach me. Now, that's only the first part of the story. After I left Father Bernardo, though, I went to Vesper service, and afterwards I met with the younger monk, and he said, We're gonna to talk today in the cloister. Well that was a profound opportunity for me. I'd been in the cloister many, many times, but when it's open to the public, the cloister is a place of meditation, it's not a place of public visitation. Mm. So here we go into the cloister, just the two of us, and we visit for 45 minutes. And they said, you need to have some time alone in this space. And he left me for a half hour during the celestial hour of the night when the shadows, the sun starts to drop low in the sky that allows things to be illuminated in all of their three-dimensionality in a way that is just absolutely gorgeous, that doesn't happen when the, the flatness of light when the sun's overhead. Right. And I made the circuit multiple times around the cloister, looking at the beautiful figures, now not as art, but as tools to assist my meditation on the meaning of the life of Christ, because all of the sculptures around are different points in the life of Christ. And then my friend comes back and says, I've just been ordained a deacon. Deacons can't do a lot of things. He's on his way to becoming a full-fledged priest, but he hasn't. But one of the things that a deacon can do is give blessings. Would you mind if I gave you a blessing? And there in this remarkable space, not knowing what had happened an hour and a half before with his colleague, Father Bernardo, this monk gave me another blessing experience the love of God, experience what it means to be encircled in the arms of safety, absolutely, in ways that are difficult for me to articulate, but an experience that was the answer to my searching, an answer that came in an unexpected place, from unexpected hands, with an unexpected intensity 
and with an ineffability, something that I can't even fully describe, but that was very directly a consequence of my experience on the Camino de Santiago. Thank you very much. And having learned to see people, I don't know if that's part of what led to you taking the time to get to know them over time and then to have that kind of a personal interaction that would result in that spiritual experience. Yeah, and it it has to come from a place of openness to the varieties of religious experience, Mm. as William James would would have put it, and to recognize that there are profound epiphanies that are available through different methods of worship and experiencing. And I'm sure you know of the story of uh, the Swedish theologian, Kirster uh, Stondahl. Yes. Um, and his message to understanding people of other faiths, to learn from those who are devoted to the faith, to not compare your best with their worst. And then the third one was to be open to holy envy, to yes. uh, be open to religious practices and experiences and insights that may be foreign to one's own personal devotion but that one might wish, ah, I would like to incorporate that in mine. That's included in sort of the founding documents of creating this show. Yeah. Oh, well, that's... that's uh, so, again, the Camino very much became a, a part of my personal search for objects of holy envy, objects in the broad sense. I'm not talking about things. I'm talking about practices, people, experiences that I could incorporate into my own uh, devotion. Let me just add one, one thing. Pilgrimage changes our sense of scale and pace. Our sense of scale, because when we fly an airplane, space is experienced in the hundreds of miles. When we drive in an automobile, scale is experienced at the speed of 70 miles an hour. When you walk, The scale is that of the wildflower, of the stream, of the individual that you encounter. So there is an intimacy that is available through the walking that is not available in the forms of transportation that we have come to rely on. And then that then leads to pace. The airplane goes at 500 miles an hour, the car at 70 miles an hour, my bicycle goes at... But the pace of walking forces one to be patient. Keats has this wonderful line in an otherwise dreary poem, Endymion, (laughs) uh, time that aged nurse rocked me to patience. That happens on the Camino. Mm. Time that aged nurse rocked me to patience. Impatience comes because you want the reward too soon. Without the journey. Without the journey, patience comes because the journey itself become so fulfilling that the destination then becomes almost secondary. So there's that, and then there's, there's a sense that the lessons that one learns have a kind of transcendence beyond any academic dimension in this way. One can do the Camino, and I think one should do the Camino, studying it, because there is so much magnificent history, so much magnificent art, so many interesting people. So you can study it aesthetically, you can study it sociologically, you can study it theologically, you can study it philosophically, demographically. I mean, and all of these things just enrich your experience. But you're not going to remember those things in detail. There are going to be just shadows of those things. And I love what William Corey said. William Corey was the headmaster of Eden School in the 19th century. And he has this wonderful little essay where he talks about the purposes of education. Most of it is pretty familiar in terms of other 19th century statements about the grand aspirations uh, for the educated mind. But he says at one point, don't worry if you can't remember everything that you learned in your classes, every sculpture that you saw in the Camino, every person's name that meant something to you. Because even the shadow of lost knowledge protects you from many illusions. Mm. I love that. So there is a residue that stays with someone after doing the Camino. This shadow of forgotten knowledge that protects us 
from some of the attitudes, some of the prejudices, some of the rushes to judgment, some of the moments of impatience. If we can just summon up those shadows, the feelings they represent, we find that the Camino experience forms the future as much as it informs the past. I think hearing you share your experiences and your thoughts, which obviously have been a lifetime informing, not just on the... You were prepared to have the experience that you had because of your life and you, your attention paid up to there. Speaking with you has sort of the same effect to me as when I pause and breathe deeply mm. and slow down. I love that you unfolded a very familiar story to me from my own tradition scripture in a way that a small origami paper might unfold to a surprisingly large surface area that I could not have imagined. I liked being taken there. And also it makes me hope that you're still, besides being an academic vice president, still teaching because I'm envious of those who are in your classroom. Thank you. John Rosenberg, thank you for what you've shared. Thank you for speaking with me today in good faith. It has been a pleasure to share your faith and the faith of your listeners. Buen camino, as we say. <laughs> May your journey be safe and satisfying. That's our time for today. Thanks to John Rosenberg, Associate Academic Vice President for Undergraduate Studies here at Brigham Young University, for generously sharing his faith and his experience walking the Camino de Santiago. In Good Faith is committed to the idea that we all benefit from hearing people of widely varying backgrounds share their personal experience with faith and belief. In fact, we think people with such experience deserve some of our best listening. If you have an experience you'd like to share or like to suggest a guest, record a voice memo and email it to ingoodfaith at byu.edu. And if you enjoy the show, be sure you leave a comment or a review where you get your podcasts. Help spread the word. All of our episodes are online at byuradio.org slash ingoodfaith. Our Twitter feed is at ingoodfaithbyu. In Good Faith is a production of BYU Radio. I'm Stephen Cap Perry. I hope you'll join me again soon, right here, In Good Faith.